if you're someone that that needs the money no matter what and you're willing to price reduce if you have to because you need to move this cash for a family home or, or whatever and you're time sensitive to that um i'm not your buyer if on the other hand you're open to receiving your price that you wanted but getting that over time you're going to net more money there's no question about it so that's that's the avatar of who we deal with people that want their price and can wait for their equity and that's more important to them than reducing and getting out of it for less cash out. Right. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, also known as the Private Money Authority. And this is the show where we talk about how to raise private money without ever asking for money. Well, my guest today is a very, very good friend of mine. He's been in real estate now for over 30 years, probably knocking on 40. Anyway, He's only raised uh, over $5 million in private money, and he does something very, very interesting, and I do it as well, but he uses private money simultaneously along with his creative strategies of buying and selling houses on terms. So what my guest is known for, he's in fact, he's not only known for it, he's actually trademarked it. And what his trademark is, quote, the secrets to creating three paydays per deal without using any of your own cash, credit, or banks. Well, simultaneously, uh, he runs his own buying and selling business with his family team, and they purchase about two to five properties month in and month out. So you're going to be listening to an individual on this show that's in the trenches every week. He's doing the business. He's very active. And what? I'm talking about here is decades of experience as well. In addition to all that, he's a four-time best-selling author. So having been through several real estate cycles, just like myself, my guest understands the challenges of this business, and he's helping students across the nation navigate the constantly changing real estate waters. In just a moment, you're going to meet my good friend, seasoned real estate investor, and the creator of Three Paydays Per Deal, Mr. Chris Prefontaine, right after this. Well, Chris, welcome back to the show, my friend. How are you? I am terrific. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm excited to have you back. Uh, it's been a little while since uh, my podcast and YouTube audience uh, have had the pleasure of learning from and listening to, as most people know you, Chris Pre. Prefontaine takes about 10 seconds to say, right? So we call you Chris Pre. But anyway, um, welcome back, Chris. Uh, we're going to talk about on this show, Raising Private Money, because after all, this is the Raising Private Money podcast. Uh, but then we're going to segue over to um, what you're really known for, and that is uh, buying and selling on terms, uh, the secrets to creating three paydays per deal, without using your own cash credit or banks. Uh, but before we uh, jump in on that, let's start with, first of all, I mean, you've done new construction, uh, you flip houses, you've done commercial. Uh, what asset class of real estate did you actually start in way back? Oh man, uh, single family, uh, actually way back would be finding spot lots, I call them, vacant lots in established neighborhoods, and then building a single family on that. And we did so naively back then in my 20s. We did so while the, the landowner waited for the house to be built and sold. And all the subcontractors did the same. So I, I didn't know it, but it was creative real estate back then, too. And uh, it was single families primarily. OK, so you started in single family. That's where I got my start as well. It's been my experience in interviewing uh, real estate investors here on the show. Uh, that have gotten into private money. And of course, you've raised millions in private money as well, that something happened in their real estate investing career to where they realized, I got to find another way to fund my deals. I, I need to find all the cash on some of my deals. 
What was it that happened in your real estate investing journey that caused you or triggered you to start raising private money? Uh, okay, so there's two tiers to that, Jay. Good question. Be when I say two tiers, one was pre-crash, to to pre-2008, one was post. And here's why I say that. Pre-2008, I was under the conventional mindset of I'll either put conventional financing in place and then I'll tack on some private financing or I'll do all private financing. And then after I went through the crash, uh, getting beat up financially, mentally and otherwise, I said, okay, enough. I'm not dealing with banks anymore at all. I'm only going to buy things that don't require cash. And so tier two came about because I said, well, wait a minute. About three years into that, which would have been somewhere around 2015-ish, 14, I said, okay, we're leaving deals on the table. So yes, we buy no money down. We buy owner financing and, and lease purchase and sub two. But what about these deals where they go, well, I just need this much. And if you did this much cash down, you get X amount of equity out of it. So we were leaving those deals on the table and started again, starting to raise a little bit. And, and it, they're a little bit proportionate to the deals to, to, to go ahead and not leave more money on the table and to create more three payday deals, basically. Right. So really what you just went over there to unpack that a little bit is one way that you can combine private money and creative strategies such as buying subject to, et cetera, seller financing, et cetera, is you can combine private money. Uh, say in a, in a second position, a small amount of money, let's say like if the seller needs a down payment, uh, won't sell on no money down, or perhaps they're behind on payments for whatever reason, uh, you can use private money to bring those payments current and et cetera. So what are some of, what are some of your favorite ways to raise private money to where, to where you do, you do feel like you're not out there chasing money, but how do you attract or how have you attracted private money? into your world? You know, Jay, it's it's been fairly simple for me because I, I started with people that knew, worked with and or trusted me. And that would be my attorney and accountant. Those are the first two. And I simply said, do you have money sitting in 401k, IRA, not earning at least seven or eight percent? And every single one of them said, of course I don't. Okay. So why don't we put that to work for you? And I showed them the three paydays, which they all love because it's different. And I showed them how they can earn with us. And, and literally those two, one who always saw my books and one who always saw my deals were the first two that started. And then referrals come. And I, I, I know you have experienced this tenfold that I have experienced where once you do the first deal, even if it's a small deal, 25, 30 grand, all of a sudden, either they or people they know have a lot more, right? It comes out <laughs> of the woodwork. So they that, always all been they tell you. <laughs> yeah. So you started out with the professionals that was already trusting you. So there's a very, very important word you said right there was trust. They had trust in you and they probably, as I've experienced, they probably were not investing in your deals. They, what they were really doing is they were investing in you. I agree. Even though of course, you know, those deals were collateralized in the note. I assume you weren't borrowing unsecured funds. Uh, but they really were investing in you and their relationship that they already had with you, right? Right. Yeah, 100%. Because look, here's a, here's a gentleman that sees my books, right? And says, well, okay, I, I got some money sitting on the sidelines. I want to put it to work. He, he actually said, I know I'll spend it. So what, what can we put it in? And <laughs> and same with same with my attorney. He had an old, um, an old 401k sitting there that was left to him. And he's like, Chris is making nothing. So that's how that started. Yeah. I love the phrase that you just said, uh, in the role play there, where you were talking about, um, what you actually said to that individual. And the phrase you used was, why don't you let us put your money to work for you? And I say that all the time. I say it all the time. I want to put your money to work for you. Or when I've got a deal ready to fund, I'll call you up and I'll put your money to work for you just as soon as possible. So the reason, in my opinion, that's such a powerful phrase is that that's an example of how we're actually serving keyword, how we're serving these private lenders to where we don't have to go around chasing and begging and selling and persuading, but we're actually, instead of asking for money, we're actually offering them an opportunity as to how they can make money. And you know, in my case, um, Chris, I've got 47 private lenders. These are all average everyday people. None of them had even ever heard of private money or private lending. They had never heard of self-directed IRAs and how they can use, as you just said, uh, an existing retirement 
fund that's not like getting them any returns. Well, <clears throat> they never heard of this opportunity. And so here I come along with my teacher hat on in a serving kind of way, showing them this opportunity. And, you know, just what's so amazing is that they have like light bulb moments, <clears throat> their eyes light up and they've just never heard of this. In fact, I don't even think any of my 47 private lenders even knows what an accredited investor is, <laughs> to tell you the truth. But <clears throat> have you had some private lenders along that way to where you actually showed them this opportunity and they'd never heard of this world before you told them? Yeah, most of it did come in some shape, form, or fashion from referrals, right? So and so <laughs> would like to talk to you about the deals that I've done with you. I think every single one of them did, but every single time I get on the phone, they've never heard of the 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 concept of how we do it, how you teach it. And they've also never heard of the three paydays. So you put those two together and it's kind of neat. It's an eye opener for them. I love it. I love it. Well, let's move over into what you are actually known for, Chris. And that is the secrets to creating three paydays. And that's buying and selling real estate on terms. So let's start right there. In your world, in your words, what does it mean? Really, in simple terms, what does it mean to be able to buy and sell real estate on terms. In, in my world, it's real simple. It's no banks. So you're never signing personally on a loan. I get calls from investors saying, yeah, but this bank will give me three more loans and this one. Give I said, don't sign personally. Please don't do that. Uh, so no banks. Secondly, little to no money. I'll never say every single time you can get no money because it's sometimes just a teeny bit needed for transfer tax or something else. But no banks, little to no money. And... Uh, terms to me means I want to create those three paydays. I didn't want to be uh, stuck on that proverbial treadmill again after the crash. That was one of the things I re-engineered and said, I'm not doing that again. So those are the main three rules, if you will. So <clears throat> what are some specific ways that people can sell to you? Sellers can sell to you on terms to where you don't have to use a local bank. Or, yep. or, or a hard money lender or any kind of institutional money. Yeah. So that's um, the three ways we buy would be owner financing. You alluded to a few of these earlier. Subject to the existing loan staying in place. So sub two is what they'll, your listeners will hear out there. And then lease purchase. Uh, lease purchase you're going to control. The other two you're going to actually own. Those are the three ways we buy. And they will be little to zero money down on those. So let's start with the first one you said. Seller financing. So, I mean, what does that mean? You're not using a bank. The seller is going to sell you their property with seller financing. How do you break that down? What's that look yeah. like? Yeah, so they become the bank. And that's why I say to them, you, you're the bank now. So I'm going to be making payments to you every single month. And side note, Jay, as you know, we mainly deal with, in our world, free and clear sellers. So we're going to make that monthly payment to them directly against principal. So let them know that we're going to give you your price. And for example, and when you become the bank, we're going to make monthly payments to you against that price is what I say. Uh, until such time, we're going to have a balloon payment due for the balance. And that could be four years, five years, six years in that range, 10 years. It could be um, that that in its simplest form. That's it. So why would a seller be interested or willing to take, monthly payments on a free and clear house. <clears throat> In fact, I, I heard you say recently, uh, one of your most popular lists that you and your students use are expired listings. They had the property in the multiple listing service. It didn't sell. Right. And in a lot of cases you could, in your words, get them their dollar, get them their price. Why would they be willing to do that? couple things. I mean, we could do this for now, but I'll give you like the top ones that I've seen and buy from, including my office building. We're always looking at either do one of two things, solve a problem that they're having or helping them accomplish a goal the conventional market's not doing. So example, two examples, uh, mixed use building, because this can be any asset class, even though I teach primarily residential just to keep from getting in the shiny object syndrome with students. The mixed use building, he was his building was sought after, is in high demand. He was free and clear. What he said to me was, Chris, the realtors don't understand that bringing me offers, I don't want cash offers. I want for estate planning reasons and for tax reasons, I want owner financing. He was adamant about it. Didn't want to get cashed out. 
And so what do we do? We help. He didn't have a problem. We helped him accomplish a goal. The conventional market wasn't helping him do. Now, switch gears a little bit. Um, free and clear couples going to leave the state. They want to leave by literally next week. They're out of time. The runway's over. They had already done in the market as an expired. Uh, they, they called me and said, can you come do that owner financing thing? They're retiring. They just wanted a cash flow stream and the conventional market didn't get it sold. So what I said to him was, how much would you have gotten if it sold with the realtor? It did not. But if it did, he said, um, I think around 183. I said, done. I'll pay 183. No money down. $923 a month principal payment. And that's what we structure with him. It took minutes on his porch because why? Because he had a problem now. He had an end of his ramp and he wanted to leave the state and winter was coming here. And he said, I just want closure on this. Well, boy, I get my price that I couldn't get. I get cash flow while I'm retired and I can let go of this now and have closure. But there's many more. Those are just two examples. So let me unpack that story. <clears throat> so you got a seller. You ask him how much would he have gotten if it had sold through the, the realtor community, through the MLS, he told you 183 is what he would have gotten if he'd sold it through the MLS and had paid a realtor. So let's, let's turn the coin upside down. When you're buying on terms and you're not having to come up with all the cash or any of the cash, how does that math? Now, I know you're going to need to keep this simple, <laughs> but how does that math work? for you as the real estate investor to be able to pay them their price. And let me do a little caveat to the question and then I'll come back and, and put a bow on it. So most, I say most, a lot of real estate investors that don't work and move in your sphere of terms, they think I got to have a spread. Yeah. I got, I got to have a big spread between what they'll actually sell it to me for all cash. Maybe they're a wholesaler. They're going to sign it out to a, another real estate investor. That's going to take the deal down, or maybe they're going to stay in the deal. And so they're going to have this big spread. And of course, you know, in the world of cash, you got the, you got the formula called maximum allowable offer. And you've got, you know, a good 30, 35, 40%, you know, like when I'm paying all cash, I'll buy, I'll buy a house all the time for 50% of the after repaired value. But back to my, my question, a lot of real estate investors and, and what, and your answer is going to be very valuable, particularly if you are a seasoned real estate investor and you always have this, I got to have a spread in my mind. So back to my question, how does the math work for you, the real estate investor to give the seller their price? Why does that work on terms when it wouldn't work with all cash? Yeah. And, and didn't sell, right, in the conventional market. So I'm going to give you the answer, and then I'm going to give a, a formula that's super simple that you can bet on and work on for the next year or two. Okay, so the, the answer is it's the three-payday system. So let me explain. Uh, number one, it is super powerful to have principal-only payments. Think of this for a second. $923 a month principal payments to this gentleman. Now, this house has been cashed out. This is a very successful deal already. But I had a four-year term on that. So that's almost 48,000, call it 42 or $43,000 over four years that paid down that principal. I didn't pay it down. I had a buyer in there who needed time to get financing and they paid me monthly. So while they were paying me monthly, my principal is going down. The other cash flow stream is while they're paying me monthly, they're paying me something higher than my 923. In this case, it was 1500. Well, this cash flow they're built in. And last but not least, there's the markup. When we do the house, we, we mark that back up to where it was on the conventional market. How can we do that if it didn't sell in the conventional market in the, say, two teens or 225, I think it was? Simple. We're selling to who? We're selling to people who they're valid, deserved buyers, but they need time. Credit repair, job seasoning, new business seasoning. So they're ready, willing, and able and anxious to jump on the path to home ownership because the banks won't do that for them yet. That process creates those three paydays and is super lucrative. Let me give you the metric I promised. When you go out and find free and clear property, in I'm going to use round numbers, and you buy it for $200,000 or more, most, most of the listeners can do that in their marketplace, 200 grand or higher, all the way up to 2 million. Then you structure at least four-year terms, 48 months or more, 
and you structure a monthly principal payment of, I'll use the 923 or 950 a month or higher, you have a six figure deal, all three pay days so every time. So that's the, I hope the short answer and the long answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let me, let me, let me recap that and review that again. If you've got a property that's a value of 200,000 or more up to 2 million and, um, and you're going to be able to buy it over a, a so you're, so are you, are you, are you amortizing it over, over, um, is that a four year balloon that you're putting yeah, in Yeah, exactly. Four year, all principal, then a balloon, whatever the balance is uh, on or before 48 months. All right. So, so it's all going towards principal. So there's no interest. Right. Um, how do you come up with the payment that you're going to offer the monthly payment you're going to offer the seller? Yeah. So we simply look at two things, Jay, that this market's helping us a lot because interest rates are a touch higher, but we look at what are the rent comps in the area, just so we're aware. And then we say, if a buyer was going to buy this house today and they were able to get a mortgage today at today's rates, what are they going to pay? Those are usually pretty close because rents are going so high now but due to the high interest rates. We're going to want to create a spread there, a delta, because we need to be a little bit lower than that to the seller so that we can go to the market and get collect that delta, which we call our payday too. But those are the two things we look at. What's a conventional loan going to cost them? Because remember what we're doing with these buyers. We're trying to train them, get them ready to be homeowners. And as such, we want to make sure that their payment's going to be fairly close to that and that they understand how that calculation works. Um, and then we, we can go to the market and know we can sell that pretty quickly. Gotcha. So you knew you were going to be able to sell this house for around $1,500 a month. Um, do you remember what you put it on the, on the, on the market to sell it for? I believe it was two and a quarter. I'm I'm a hundred percent certain it was two and a quarter. So you buy for 183, you turn around and sell it for two and a quarter. Did you find your buyer in the multiple listing service by offering under financing or, or Facebook marketplace? Yeah, we don't use, um, MLS. I, I don't think we've done it ever. Um, we, uh, have a company called Prosperity. We used to do this manually. But now about two years ago, a company called Prosperity uh, takes the property, markets to all the portals for us. So they'll hit the Craigslist, the rent links, the, you know, all the portals that we used to do manually, all automatic. And then after we fill the property, we selected our, our buyer who needs time to get mortgage ready. They will actually act as a uh, escrow company, collect the rent and pay us the difference and pay the mortgage or the seller in this case. So it's pretty automated now. Right. So when you, when you were negotiating with that seller sitting there on the front porch, um, did you get the seller to tell you what's the least they could take per month? Or did you start out with offering them so much per month? You're going to rack my memory now because this was a while ago. Um, okay. So I got the price from him and then I believe I created the, the monthly, but the question is always, if I get you to that price and we can manage within the term, what's the least you can take? That is a hundred percent my script. Um, you're, you're testing my memory of about nine years ago, but I believe that I created the, the, the third, he created the first two, the term. Okay. And the yeah. Got you. So I was wondering if you're wanting to, if you're typically, you're wanting to get the seller to name their yeah. lease, the, the lease that they could take per month. Yep. Excellent. So when you're talking to a seller about buying on terms, um, how do you approach the conversation as far as, um, offering, if they never thought of it, what type of benefits could you tell the seller that they would have if they did sell on terms? Typically more cash out. If you don't need your cash today, that's my short answer to them. I said, look, if you're someone that, that needs the money, no matter what, and you're willing to price reduce, if you have to, because you need to move this cash for a family home or, or whatever, and you're time sensitive to that. Um, I'm not your buyer. If on the other hand, you're open to receiving your price that you wanted, but getting that over time, you're going to net more money. There's no question about it. So that's, that's the avatar of who we deal with people that want their price and can wait for their equity. And that's more important to them than reducing and getting out of it for less cash out. Right. And as we talked about a few minutes ago, um, one of your best list of prospects for buying on or for selling on terms are those that tried to sell it in the multiple listing service and they couldn't. 
Yeah, because there is obviously there you're dealing with that criteria that I said we were you probably fixing something, right? It could be it could be the price, but it could have been a bunch of other things that the reason they didn't sell, right? There's a there's a large percentage right now, Jay, we're actually using this list, which we never used in the past, where they're listed for 60 days and you can look and say, oh, 60 days have been on and there's very little equity, which means they're not going to be able to reduce with their realtor and, and afford to knock them out of pocket. So that's a great list too. Okay. So make sure everybody understood that. Uh, a house that was in the multiple listing service, it's been in there, it's been in there for 60 days at least. And there's very little equity, which means they don't have the flexibility right. to come down on price. So here you come along with uh, offering terms and it's back to this whole framework of what we've been talking about. And that is offering solutions, offering solutions. So to those expired listings that you would reach out to, uh, give or take, what would you say is a ballpark is what percentage of people might be open to that conversation? On the initial calls from the virtual assistant, about a third are at least open to hearing. And then about 10 to 15, it can be higher depending on the marketplace, but 10 to 15% of those will get to the table where we can probably do an appointment. Gotcha. So um, we got, we got some in the audience here, people that have, brand new to real estate investing. We got very seasoned real estate investors as well. But for those that uh, have not really started yet, does someone they have to be full time to do this business the way you do it? No, it's the biggest question I get because the, the perception in any niche in real estate, at least that I hear is that, oh, I got to throw all this energy at it. You can, but 99% of the people that come into our community have a J-O-B and some of them very lucrative job. So uh, they definitely don't have to be. And I would even go so far as to say, don't try to do that right away. Let's make sure you have a nice, uh, comfortable ramp as you build your three paydays. And let's face it, if you get three or four of these deals, recently a guy in our community, Rick, did four of them all over six figures. And then he started planning to leave his J-O-B after 30 years. He worked for the government. So I would say plan on being part time. Now, if you have a nest egg and you're making a move for full time, I can set that strategy up with you too. But most aren't able to do that. Yeah. So, you know, there's all kinds of different ways to invest in real estate, even in, you know, single family or residential. I mean, obviously there's wholesaling, flipping, rehabbing, renting apartments. How would you compare this strategy that you've been talking about to these other ways of investing? Um, painfully, I've done a lot of those. Um, I would, I would hit a few of them off the top of my head that you said, uh, wholesaling and flipping. Look, I have good friends that do it and they've been on my show, but the fact is that's very transactional. That's very, what I call old way getting paid once. And I remember like it was yesterday getting to January every year and going, oh man, I did a lot of deals last year, but I got to do it again. And so our three payday system takes that off the table and allows you to get continuous money. Every time you launch a property, you get a, you launch a cash flow stream and you launch a future date cash out and they all differ. So that provides a nice quality of income. And then the competition, Jay, let's face it, you wholesaling and, and, and flipping right now, super, super competitive. And the seller gets the call from everyone constantly and they, they know, they know they're going to get low balls. So the wall comes right down when you start talking terms and the fact that you're not, it's not about that. It's about the term. It's a whole different conversation. Um, so it's, it's very interesting when you start taking it from that, from that standpoint. So I guess the money for you, the quality of income, not just the quantity, and then the conversations, they're pleasant. You know, they're not, we're trying to steal that house or we're trying to lowball that house. It's not that at all. And so if you're out there now wholesaling or rehabbing, man, look at all these deals that you might've thrown away. Keep doing what you're doing, but don't throw the other deals away. You now can do them. I love it. I can't imagine over the years until I learned your way of doing it, how many millions of dollars I threw away in the trash can. You and me both. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's like, um, I mean, I want to repeat essentially what you just said. Like if someone that's listening to this show is a wholesaler or, you know, I've rehabbed over 500 properties myself right. on, on major fix and flips and, if that's been, if that's the way you're in a box and you've been just thinking that way, all this other way that Chris is buying houses can be a huge bonus, can be a huge bonus and, and complement what, you know, what you've already been doing. 
Well, you've got a community and, and I'm so thankful you have introduced me to your community, but you've got a community called the wicked smart. And I see you got your t-shirt on. You got the wicked smart community and tell, tell us what is the wicked smart community and how can people learn more about what you do? Yeah, we hang out. I, I think the community is big. Any, any community, your, your community is amazing too. And, and likewise comment, I'm, I'm happy to be part of it. But when you're in a community, there's that interactive approach that happens, right? You have instant access to Slack, for example, in our case, and you have 140 or 50 other people that can help you. Well, that's huge. When you, when you start hitting the speed bumps that are normal in real estate, they're normal. They're normal every week, sometimes every day. Um, I, I would love to, for your tribe, Jay, um, give the free book. Uh, for those that may not have gotten it in the past, just go to wickedsmartbooks.com forward slash J and the numeric number one. Uh, that would be the best place to start if you're brand, brand new. If you've been at this a little bit and or everything we're saying is resonating and it's kind of processing quickly, then go to smartrealestatecoach.com forward slash master's class and you'll get a, the, my free workshop. So there's no one there talking to your freshman year. You go at your own pace. It's free. And you decide if that's something you want to pursue further. That's all. Excellent. So I want to repeat those because we got a lot of people listening on the audio podcast. So Chris's book, which is fantastic. It's called real estate, uh, on your terms, right? Chris, real estate mm -hmm. on your terms. Mm -hmm. And you can pick that book up for free at www.wickedsmartbooks.com forward slash J A Y and the numeric one. And then you've got the free masterclass that Chris just offered up. That's at www.smartrealestatecoach dot com forward slash masters class and of course we're going to have these uh, urls and websites in the show notes as well but chris i tell you what you covered a lot of ground in the time we had together thank you so much for joining me and parting words um yeah i would say in my 33 years it's 33 years this month jay so i'm thinking about this lately and in my 33 years never has there been sort of a convergence of things going on in the marketplace between uncertainty and interest rates and the timing with banks, never to create such high demand in creative real estate. So now is the time when you kind of look back for two or three years, some of you two or three decades and go, I am super glad I got my hand on that during that time. It's good always, but it's never been better than right now. So take advantage of it for sure. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. God bless you. And I'm sure I'll be talking to you soon. Thank you. <laughs> And thank you, my listener and viewer. Thank you for joining us for another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I appreciate uh, you taking a listen today. And I always appreciate you giving us feedback, like, share. If you're listening on one of the uh, podcast platforms, be sure and follow me. And, if you and be sure to subscribe. Uh, and if you happen to be watching on YouTube, be sure and subscribe and click that bell so you don't miss out on any of the upcoming amazing episodes. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. And I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jayconner.com slash money guide. That's J-C-O-N-N-E-R.com slash money guide. And download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconnor.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.